Now, if you've been with us last week, you know we started a summer series called What's in a Word? We're looking at some of the transformational words, verbs from the New Testament. Last week's word, anybody remember what it was? Believe. It comes from Romans uh, chapter 10, verse 9, and we're going to have a memory verse for each week. Now, I don't I'm not foolish enough to believe that all of you will memorize every week, but I would encourage you to take this challenge. Write out the verse, type it out, put it on your bathroom mirror, on the dashboard of your car, somewhere where you'll see it every day, and let God's words speak to you as we go through this series this summer. But this is our memory verse from last week. Let's say it together. you got a cheat sheet on the screen here. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus, I said let's say it together. Ready? <laughs> if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Pretty good verse to memorize. Believe. And we're going to look at a different word here this morning. The word is, can you guess what it is? Love. Right? Could there be a broader topic to preach on for 30 minutes? Maybe life, right? Love. And when Pastor Brian and I were laying out the series we talked about, I thought, well, love, how, do you, how are you going to cover that in a half an hour? So we're going to stay until like 1.30, 2, if that's all right with you. Only kidding. We won't do that. But I did think, like, okay, so it's hard to preach on love. How do you possibly cover that? On the other hand, how do you leave that word out if you're doing a uh, series on the transformational words in the New Testament? Love has to be in there. And so we're going to look at, at the significance of this word from a biblical perspective. Because in our culture, we, let's be honest, we use the word in so many ways, it's almost lost all significance, hasn't it? Like, I love Mexican food, which I do. I love Italian food, which I do. Or I love Chinese food, which I do, right? <laughs> or I love the Blackhawks, which I do. Or I love the Cubs, which I do. Or I love the Sox, which I don't, right? <laughs> right, we use the word all the time in all kinds of ways. I love summer vacation. Oh, I love this song when it comes on the radio. I love my children, a little different. I love my wife. I love my family. What are we talking about when we use this word all over the place? Are we just talking about degrees of emotion, based on our response to a song or a meal or someone that we care about? Is it just like a range of what we feel? Honestly, that's probably what most of the people in our culture and in the church think about when they think about love, how they feel based on the experience or circumstance in that moment. What are we talking about when we talk about love? Well, we can agree we're all over the place as a culture. So let's ask the question, what is God talking about when he talks about love? And to do that, we're going to look at a specific passage from one of the letters of John, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. You can turn there with me or look on the screens. 1 John 4, verses 7 through 11. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now I'm going to guess that's familiar territory to many of you. If you didn't know the reference or the whole verse, you've certainly heard some of those passages before, haven't you? Specifically verse 8, right? God is love. We've all heard that. We've used that phrase, and everyone likes that, that expression, God is love. We'll come to that in a couple of minutes. John wrote this, 1 John, 2 and 3 John, his letters. John the Apostle also wrote the gospel that bears his name. And he also wrote one other book in the New Testament. This is not actually John. It might have been, but we didn't have photographs of him. But anybody know the last book, the book that John wrote, the third or fourth book he wrote? Revelation, the last book of the New Testament. He wrote that while in exile on the island of Patmos, an island in the Mediterranean Sea where he was exiled. He wrote Revelation there on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Late in his life, he's an old man, very frail. He's released from his exile, and he comes back, and he spends the latter years of his life in and around the church at Ephesus. And that's from there he writes some of these letters. And uh, church historians, uh, historical do documents, origin, early church father, tells us that at the end of his life, John was so old and weak and by the way, he's the only one of the 12 disciples to make it to die of old age. Paul was beheaded, Peter crucified upside down, James run through with the sword. Only John, like, makes it to the end of his natural life. And at the end, he's so weak he can't come in physically, he can't get himself in to the gathering of worship. But he so desperately wanted to be there that the elders of the church would carry him in on a pallet and set him down for worship. And Origen writes that on the last, his very last day in church, his last words were, Beloved 
Let us love one another. Sounds like John. He wrote some of the very same things. He's known as the apostle of love. Not because he was like a, a really sappy, sentimental guy. Not because he was somehow in touch with his feminine side or something. Because he was in touch with something. The deep foundational principle that's at the core of the gospel, what it means to be a Christian. Something that goes to the very essence of the being of God himself. Love. So I want to ask three questions about love as we see it laid out in this text that might help us in our lives today. The first question is this. Where does love come from? I know it sounds simplistic and obvious, but it's important to talk about. Where does love come from? What's the source? Well, if you were paying attention, John says it in no uncertain terms, verses 7 and 8. He says, dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. What do we mean when we say the phrase God is love? I think it's an oft quoted but equally often misunderstood verse. What are we, what are we saying when we say that God is love? Well, for one thing, we're saying more than saying that he's loving, right? Because, he, of course, he is loving. But I could observe you, observe my friend Greg there and see how he's loving toward his wife and sons if I catch him on a good day, right? I could say, look how loving he is. But I'm observing his actions in his life. So when we say God is love, we're saying more than just he acts in loving ways, which, of course, he does. We're saying that in himself, he is love. Love is a verb. It's a, it's a relational action word, Right? How would you know if someone's loving? How would you know? The look on their face? What they wear? How they walk? No. You'd have to see it in context of relationships. How patient they are, how kind they are, how selfless they are in the context of, of relating to somebody else. That's how you know if someone is loving. What we're saying when we say that God is love, if he created no one and nothing, he would still be love. How's that possible? We're saying something. We don't have time to get into this too much here this morning. But what we're saying is something about the Trinitarian nature of God. The Trinity. Father, Son, and Spirit. Three persons, one God. Existing in perfect loving relationship within himself for all eternity. So that if, no, if God created nothing and no one, he would still be love. In the way that he loves within his own being. I know it's hard to wrap your mind around this morning. But when we say God is love, we're saying he's the source of it all. He has to look, does not look outside of himself to find inspiration to be loving. He is love. And all observations of human love are derivatives. They're glimpses of the real thing, the essence, in other words. Even if they don't acknowledge or recognize it. Okay, but still, saying that God is love is theologically interesting and maybe accurate, but how does that help us, practically speaking, in our own lives? Let's ask the next question then. What does love look like? If we know love comes from God because God himself is love, what does love look like when we see it? Now, it's so deeply ingrained in us to think about love in terms of our feelings and our emotions. Now, I know that you, most of you are astute enough that if I asked you, you know, uh, is love based on your feelings, you'd say, no, 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 love is, love is more than a feeling. Didn't Boston write a song called More Than a Feeling? I don't think they were talking about biblical love. It's a good song, though. We're off the subject, right? <laughs> love is more than how you feel. But in our culture, I think that that's, we can't help but think of it that way. Moms and dads, for just a minute, let me, and grandparents as well if you're here, let me ask you a question. Have you ever stood in your kid's room when they were young, late at night, and watched them sleep? Of course you have. Kids, don't be creeped out by this. All parents do this, right? <laughs> we do it when you're young. When you're older, if we do it, it's probably for other reasons. But when you're younger, we're doing this, what is he up to? Right? When you're younger, we stand in your doorway sometimes and we watch you in your crib or the bed. Right? You remember doing this, moms and dads? And I remember with Noah, he's ni almost 19, when he was, he was four pounds, six ounces at birth. So I was just checking to see, did we screw it up? Is he still living? Is his chest moving? You, know? you just watch him. And how, how would you describe the emotions you have when you watch your little baby girl or boy sleeping? Hard to put into words, right? Humility, joy, hope, gratitude, it's all mixed together. It's hard to capture that, isn't it? It's overwhelming. Most of us would describe that emotional experience, the swirling mass of all those things, as love. You're feeling love for your son or daughter, right? Biblically speaking, wrong. The feelings are not wrong themselves, but it's not love. Not in love in a biblical sense. What you feel in that moment, that is not biblically speaking love. Because love is not how you feel. A friend of mine helped me understand this in a powerful way. He's a recovering alcoholic, many years sober now, and um, he's taught me a lot. He said when he was 
not sober in the throes of his alcoholism. He'd be out all night sometimes, sometimes more than a night, on benders, drinking, binges, wasting the family money, jeopardizing the security of his children, estranged from his wife and kids, damaging those relationships. And he would come home after being out all night or a couple nights drinking, and he would go into his kids' rooms. And he would stand in the doorway, just like I described, and he would stare at them sleeping and have all the feelings we just talked about. And he said to me, I wasn't loving them. In fact, I didn't love them. I felt sentimental about them in that moment. But I wasn't loving them. Well, how, how can we say that? He said, of course you love them. You just were struggling. He says, no, I know I really wasn't. Because biblically speaking, love has nothing to do with how you feel in a given moment. And everything to do with how you act over the course of time, regardless of how you feel. Remember the 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter? You heard it read it, it's read at weddings, right? Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love never fails. It's a beautiful poetic description of the attributes of love. But what if Paul, who wrote 1 Corinthians, wrote that from our culture's perspective, from an emotional perspective, defining love? I took the liberty of rewriting 1 Corinthians 13 from <laughs> basis, on the basis of our cultural definitions today. Love is happy. Love is sweet. Love is sappy. Love is neat. It gives you the warm fuzzies. It never makes you sad. Love never leaves you lonely. Love always makes you glad. It's ridiculous. It doesn't mean anything. It's like a bad Hallmark card. What is that? Right? Oh, if, like, it's not even, it's like, it's bad poetry. It's just bad, right? And I, we might not use those words, but that's how our culture thinks about love. The, the depth of what you feel in a moment. And it's empty. It's pointless. It does nothing to change someone's life. Feelings come and go. Think about what Paul did say. Love is patient, kind. It's not self-seeking. It's not rude. It keeps no record of wrongs. What are these things? These are actions, things that you see in the context of a relationship. Let me give you then a definition of biblical love. Actually, it's an expansion of something C.S. Lewis wrote in his book, The Four Loves, which I highly recommend to you. And by the way, have you ever wondered what Lewis's voice sounded like? I, I, you can hear him. Today, if you go, you can download an MP3 of The Four Loves. It's the only surviving recording of him reading his own work start to finish. You could probably get that this afternoon. It'd be a good Father's Day present if you haven't shopped yet for your dad. <laughs> anyway, in his book, The Four Loves, talking about God's love, he writes this. Love is not affectionate feeling, but a steady desire and action for the loved one's ultimate good. I'm going to expand on what Lewis wrote and give you my definition of biblical love. This won't be on the screen, but if you're a note taker, you might want to jot this one down. I'll say it a couple of times. Love is a deep desire and self-sacrificing commitment to the ultimate good of the beloved. Love is a deep desire and self-sacrificing commitment to the ultimate good of the one that you love. That's the Bible's understanding of love. It's not about how you feel. It's about your desire for their ultimate good and your willingness to sacrifice your own self for that in your actions, in great and in small ways. This is why in verses 9 and 10, John gives us such a beautiful picture of love. He says in verses 9 and 10, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now, everybody loves verses 7 and 8, right? Dearly beloved, let us love one another, for God is love. Love, love, love. All you need is love. Love is all you need, right? Let's dispense with this doctrine stuff about Jesus and the cross and atonement and all that, and let's just stick to love, man, because that's all we need, really just to love each other. The church is divided over all this doctrine. Doctrine causes division. It's not necessary. Let's just, let's just love one another. This is the prevailing view in many churches in our culture. But as soon as we begin to talk about the nature of what love is, you're putting forth a doctrine. Doctrine just means teaching. An understanding of what love is, you're setting forth some doctrine about the nature of love. It's unavoidable. And in, in fact, if, well, this is not on the screen, but flip back in your Bibles to John, 1 John 3, verse 23. John says, and this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another. 
Over and over again, the New Testament, particularly John, links these things inextricably. The understanding of who Christ is and what the cross means cannot be separated from the command to love each other. They, they, they go together perfectly. People love verses 7 and 8, but 9 and 10 make you a little uncomfortable. It gets specific and personal. And in verse 10, really, this is our memory verse, by the way. Notice he begins by saying, this is love. The English translation doesn't quite capture it because it ought to have an exclamation point. It's like a, an exclamation. He's saying, this is love. Look, look, there it is. Do you see it? That's love. What causes your heart to do? Look at that. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that incredible? Isn't, doesn't that blow your mind? What causes you to do that? Is it maybe seeing the sacrificial love of a mother for her children? Maybe, maybe a soldier? who gives up his or her life for their, their brothers or sisters in arms? Or, or, or is it perhaps a, a friend who would donate an organ to save the life of another friend? Sacrifice, right? Great sacrifice. Or it, remarkable acts of love that sort of that, that shock us. Like, for example, a couple days ago when I read in, in the wake of just the heart-wrenching tragedy in Charleston, South Carolina, about members of that church, that family of God, our brothers and sisters in Christ, have already said, we forgive him, the man who took nine lives in a Bible study. That's love. John says, all these things which cause our hearts to soar, they're derivatives, they're, they're little glimpses. And if you want to see the real thing, look to the cross. Look, he says, this is love. There it is. You see it? This is love. Notice what he says, not that we loved God. Why does John say it that way? Why not just say, this is love, that God sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins? Why does he add the negative? Why have to say, this is love, not that we love God? I think because there is such a strong human desire to define it on our terms, on, based on our love, our love for God. Religion works this way. All religions work this way. Not the gospel, but all religions work on this, this principle of, I act in loving ways. I, 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 I give God a good record. I serve. I give. I go to church. I try to be a good person. I go to a husband, a good father. And God looks at me and, 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 and is pleased with my effort and loves me in return. That's not the gospel. John says, this is love. Not that you loved God. We are not to define love on our terms. We're to define it in terms of his love for us. That he loved us. Because verse 10 is really an explanation of verse 8. Verse 8, that when everyone likes God is love, verse 10 explains how that works. You cannot separate the doctrine of God's love from the doctrine of who Christ is and what he did at the cross. C.S. Lewis, again, in the book Four Loves, says God's, God loves us not because we're lovable, but because he is love. Not because he needs to receive anything from us, but because he delights to give. I think he's exactly right. God loves you not because you're lovable. Let's face it, you're not that lovable. I know your mom tells you different, but she might be the only one who thinks of you that way. right? The truth is we're not, in, in comparison to a holy, perfect God, we're not deserving. We're not lovable. We're sinful. So to, as a Christian, we understand that God does not love me because I'm good. But because he loves me, he can make me good. There's all the difference in the universe between those two statements. And John said, this is love. Not that you love God. Not that you did anything deserving or that you're, you're better, prettier, more talented. But because he loves you. So finally, let's ask, we've seen where does love come from. It comes from the nature and character of God himself. God is love. We see what it looks like. It's love on display at the cross. What does love produce? John says that if we understand the source of love, and if we then see the perfect example of love on display, and that gets into our hearts, it ought to do something. There ought to be some tangible evidence of it in our lives. What does love produce? You read verses 11 and 12. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. What is John saying here? 
Love on display at the cross, when it gets into your hearts, ought to produce love on display in the world. In fact, we didn't talk about this much, but John, in these letters, is writing at a time when the church was under attack from a lot of false teachers. Not like our day, of course. Nobody would ever teach a false gospel. But in his day, this happened. That was sarcasm, in case you're wondering. In his day, it happened. And they were talking about Gnosticism, which is like a, a belief that there was secret higher knowledge for the spiritual elite. It created a lot of division in the church. And he's saying, essentially, you know what the litmus test is for authentic teaching of, of the genuine truth? You know how you know if someone is, is from God and telling the truth? Not by their words necessarily, but look at their life. By their displayed love for God and for other people. Watch them. How do they treat their spouse and their children? How do they treat other people, even those who cannot love them in return or have nothing to offer them in terms of their position in life? See how they love. Then you'll know if they're for real. As far as John is concerned, you cannot love as God calls you to love. Now, you can act in loving ways, but you cannot love the way God calls us to love if you have not embraced the truth of Jesus Christ. And the truth of Jesus Christ has not embraced you until it produces a love for God and for people. The 17th century English metaphysical poet Thomas Traherne. Now, are you familiar with Thomas Traherne? No, I wasn't either until I read about him in C.S. Lewis, by the way. <laughs> Traherne uh, wrote a remarkable book. He, I mean, they, he's a 17th century English mystic, so he uses weird language. But he, he writes this book called A Century of Meditation. And he has this beautiful chapter in the middle of his book where he begins every refrain by saying, you never enjoy the world aright until, and then he has some explanation. Let me share one of them with you that's been profound for me. He says, you never enjoy the world aright until you esteem every soul in it as great a treasure as your Savior doth. You just say the word doth and you sound smart, right? You never enjoy the world right until you look at every soul in it the way God looks at them, as a great treasure, until you esteem them. i got to be honest, I don't think I'm there. Oh, I esteem my children and my wife and my family and all of you and the people that are like me. But if, if God's love is real in my life, it ought to be manifesting itself in a deep love for all people. All kind, now, now, by the way, let's remember what the definition of love is. A deep desire and self-sacrificing commitment for their ultimate good. Which doesn't always mean telling them what they want to hear. Doesn't always mean, in our culture, love means never contradict, never stand in the way, always accept and back every decision your friend makes. That's how you love them. Not so in, in, in scripturally. If I desire your ultimate good, it might mean sacrificing how much you like me in the moment to tell you the truth, or vice versa. A deep desire and genuine self-sacrificing commitment for the ultimate good of the one who is loved. Isn't that the cross? God so deeply desired your ultimate good that you would be called his son or daughter, that he sacrificed himself for that, to call you his beloved. This is love. Not that we love God but that he loved us and sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's our verse for this week. Let's say it together. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Just recently my parents celebrated their 50th, or they're going to actually, we, we celebrate as a family early, their 50th anniversary. My, my sisters and their families and my family all came together. My mom and dad stayed in, a, in one house in Georgia for a week. We put to test how much we love each other, right? <laughs> but it was great. And one of the things we did, we looked at some pictures of my mom and dad when they were young. And we could see resemblance of my son and my daughter and my, my nephews and nieces when they were my, in my, in my mom and dad when they were young. You could see it, right? Have you ever done that? You could see little glimpses of, of the family members. Family resemblance. John says, you want to resemble your heavenly father? You want to take on the characteristics of belonging to his family. This is the distinguishing mark of those who belong to Jesus. That we love each other. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we confess that we often doubt it and, and lose sight of it. But thank you for the reminder through your word and through worship that you love us with an everlasting love. And that despite the, the confusing messages of our culture, love is on display at the cross. Let us look no further for the source and the life-changing power of your love. We pray it in your name. Amen.